I guess we can start now. Okay. Hey, everybody. <laughs> hey. Hi. I can't see you, so I'm going to assume the room is totally packed, and that's awesome. So. Um, There's more people here than we're here to see Dries, right? Yeah. Good job. There you go. If you want to come down to the front and get cozy, feel free, you know. But if you'd rather check email us, feel free. So, um, my name is Angie Webchick Byron, and this is Greg Hayrocker Dunlap. And we're Hi. here today to talk about scaling the Drupal community. Uh, so, to talk a little bit about how the community has evolved over the years, sort of the point that we're at now, um, some of the challenges that we face as a community as we grow larger, and sort of, you know, start up uh, hopefully a healthy discussion on what what we should do about some of this kind of stuff. Because, uh, you know, we're not coming here with solutions per se, but more to like just create an avenue where we can discuss some of the, uh, some of the things that have been coming up in the community recently. So. Okay. So um, uh, there's a lot of parallels between Drupal and the, the stages that a startup company goes through. So if we imagine Drupal as a startup company that started 10 years ago, right? So you start up and you're kind of small and scrappy, right? And you're very engineering focused and it's very exciting. You've got like 10 engineers and you're all like, locked in a room, kicking ass, and uh, everybody's really focused on the same problem. You need to build something exciting and get it done. And uh, it's a cool time, and everybody sleeps on the floor and eats nothing but beer and pizza all day long, and it's really exciting and fun, and it's like a big party, but everyone works really hard, and they're all really excited, too, and that's great. Um, but then a funny thing happens as you start to do that, and that's like, people start using the stuff that you're building. Oh my God, and so now all of a sudden, it's funny because if you, you, could, you could plot all sorts of graphs about Drupal, but they would all look exactly like this. Um, and so what happens then is that the project grows and more and more people come in. Um, and one of the things that starts to happen as that happens is that um, obviously the way that you work has to change. Um, there's more people involved. Um, and your focus starts to shift a little bit as well. But the other thing is that things start to slow down as well. It can't be as exciting and quick as it was when you were 10 people locked in a room. Um, and, the, um, and this is also the point in a startup company usually when management starts showing up. And so now you've got people to report to and you've got HR staff and all of this kind of stuff. And this is where things, this is where you start turning into an actual, what, what appears to be a real like corporate atmosphere. Um, another thing that ha can happen also in the growth uh, part is that as those management people start coming in, uh, a lot of times they don't come from the ranks of the people who have been working with the company for a long time. Because, you know, nerds like me aren't necessarily the best people to be managing your HR department and stuff like that. And those people cause not only some can cause some resentment from the people who have been around for a long time, but they also cause a separation between the leadership and the people who have been doing the work which wasn't there when you were all sitting around drinking beer and eating pizza. Um, and then what you do is you get to the success phase. And it's funny because, you know, people start companies because they want to achieve success. But it so often happens that the people who start the companies get to the success phase and they're irritated and pissed off and bitter. And, and it's, it's because, you know, they don't really think in their mind about what success looks like when they start up. And so now we've got a situation where we've got the White House running on Drupal and we've got a thousand contributors and we've, you know, the, Dru the global Drupal community is like hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue through across everything. But it means that our, our culture has changed and the way that we work together and work as a group has changed and so um, things will move a lot more slowly for instance one of the things that we introduced in Drupal 7 is the uh, automated testing on patches and you weren't able to get your um, patch committed unless it passed all the tests now that's a good thing for the stability of the project but it also means that it makes it harder and slower to get your patches committed um, another thing that happens is that, you know, uh, organizing large changes and large architectural changes takes a lot more planning. You spend more time in meetings. You have to worry about, 
like your feature set and how it compares with your competition and what markets you want to grow into and all of this crazy kind of stuff. I mean, you know, Dries had that slide in his session earlier about uh, how, how companies go from being engineering focused to marketing focused, and that's really what's happening to us as well. Um, and another thing that happens out of that is that um, you spend a lot more time fighting fires rather than growing and building what you're doing. And we saw that with uh, what we're trying to focus on now with uh, keeping our bug counts low and things like that. Um, so it's really interesting to look at to look at the parallels in the way that we've grown, the way that corporations have been growing for you know dozens of years, and uh, see what we can't find in that terms of that from parallels. Um, and so as we were talking about this and talking about this uh, presentation, we sort of found two ways in which the Drupal community is scaling. And one is how we scale our resources, how we grow the number of people and allow more people to contribute, but also how we scale our community, how we keep what's important to our community in the face of this massive growth and infusion of capital into Drupal, basically. And so I will hand this off to Angie to take on the next bit here. Uh, sure. So okay. when we talk about, uh, the, you know, the first side of this is like resources, and by that we mean like people, we mean like tools, things like that. So let's talk a little bit about the structure of the community and basically who's in charge around here, which kind of looks a little like this. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, if we look at the evolution of the community structure over the years, um, it sort of starts to look like this. So in 1999, you had Dries. You know, this was Dries's project. He built it in his dorm room in, you know, Antwerp, and he kind of called all the shots and kind of did his own thing. Um, when he open sourced it in 2001, uh, it was him and a couple of his friends. It was Stephen Wittens and uh, Kiartan Jansen, and uh, you know they, they were sort of equal level. It was like they all sort of ran the project together, and there were you know a, a few different people who also contributed you know patches via email and that kind of a thing. Um, but it was very like small group of people, um, and everyone was kind of like focused you know around one specific area, sort of. Uh, parallel to what Greg was talking about, when you're in that scrappy startup phase and you're, you know, just a bunch of engineers with pizza and beers. By 2005, when Drupal had hit sort of its growth phase, um, we started to see a transition and sort, sort of more of a hierarchy forming. So Dries and uh, Stephen Wittens both kind of escalated to sort of this uber, you know, project lead, project management kind of thing. Um, and then beneath them, they had uh, branch maintainers, so Neil Drum and uh, Gerhard Kilsreiter that you know maintained one specific version of Drupal, and then below that you started to get a much bigger pool of people who were contributing patches, and this was all in the interest of like sort of like you know making sure that people could scale out. Um, we also like appointed people like a security team lead and a documentation team lead because that all used to be done by the three guys at the top or whatever, and now it was sort of expanding out. And now if you look at Drupal today. Um, you see a few different things going on. So one is that Dries has sort of like become like the grand poobah overseer of the entire project. He's sort of like in charge of the whole thing. He's the project lead. He's the president of the Drupal Association. And you can see his dot keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, he's also kept the branch maintainer paradigm. So there's me for Drupal 7. There's Gabo for Drupal 6. But now we've also started appointing additional leads below that. So there's the Drupal 8 initiative leads. There's people in maintainers.txt that are sort of given a larger voice than others in the project. Um, and we've also seen, like, say, the documentation team starting to scale out and appoint two leads instead of just one. We've seen the infrastructure team expand out from one person to an entire team managing that. And then below that, you've got all of these individuals. And there are a few that are colored in pink that are sort of like have a louder stick than other people, or louder stick, a bigger stick than other people. But it's not obvious out from the outside of the community who those people are until you accidentally mouth off to Earl, you know, Earl Miles and his issue queue when you get smacked in the face, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and you also see people kind of pulling apart and some people going off into silos a little bit. And you see people sort of you know, there, there might be this group of people that works on core, and this group of people that works on contrib, and this group of people that, you know, doesn't use the forums ever, and this group of people that only uses the forums, and sort of, you know, as, as almost as like a matter of sanity, people are starting to branch off into their own little groups, because they just can't take it anymore with that many people all crowding in at once. So this is sort of how the evolution of the community structure is going, and we've introduced a couple of things to sort of like formalize this stuff more. So one is, you know, and when we talk about scaling people, we, you know, these Drupal 8 initiative leads. This was a big step for the project for, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that 
every release prior to Drupal 8, the way that core development has been done is basically, you know, Dries posts a post and says, please, please reply here with what you want to work on for this release. And everyone would say, like, I'm going to fix forums, or I'm going to fix performance, or I'm going to work on this crazy new idea I have, and it would kind of go like that. And then people would do, like, half of that stuff, or none of it at all. But, you know, it was sort of, like, driven by the people who wanted to do stuff. And we still have that. Like, that's still, the duocracy model is still fundamentally part of our community, and that's what we do. But it's interesting because this was the first time that the project lead actually said, no, these are things that we should actually really focus on. And not only that, but I'm going to actually appoint people to really pay attention to those things. So we have yet to see how this is going to play out because this whole initiative thing is still pretty new. But it's interesting because it's, it's more of a top-down direction setting than we've had traditionally in the past. Um, the nice thing, though, is that, you know, when we do a survey of all of the Drupal people in the world, they come back and they tell us, yeah, that's the stuff we want. Oh, and also this stuff, you know, which is good. It sort of validates the direction that we're going. But it's interesting that the core development process itself has gotten a lot more sort of directed, or at least attempted to be directed, and we'll have to see how that goes. Another thing that we've done a lot of work with scaling is on infrastructure. This is a graph of the number of committers that we have on Drupal.org before and after the Git migration. Um, people didn't like CVS, it turns out. Uh, yeah. So, um, so, but that's an example of you know, a change that we made to our tools that enabled lots of more people to get involved. Um, and so looking for items like that, that, you know, if this is a barrier to contribution, let's knock it out of the way to allow more people in. But it's also going to mean more work on sort of the output filtering, right? Because let's say everyone can create a module. Woo! Everyone creates modules, and suddenly we go from 10,000 modules to 50,000 modules. Well, you're going to have this problem where there's like 1,000 voting modules, and you still need to find the one that works for you. So we also need to do better tools of like searching and ratings on projects and things like that. Better ways for people to find what they're looking for as we scale this up. But this is all related to tools and this is all Drupal.org stuff um, that, that we can do. We're giving a core conversation about that tomorrow, by the way, if you want to learn more about that. At what time? I have no idea. <laughs> it's in your mobile application and stuff. Um, the second side of this is scaling the culture of the project, right? When it's 10 people around pizza and beers, it's really easy to keep the same culture and everybody to have, you know, similar values and things that they look at. Um, but in Drupal, it's become harder and harder to sort of maintain that culture. It's really great when we have these Drupal cons because it exposes a lot of new people to the people who've been around for a while, and I think a lot of that rubs off. Um, but, but it's very challenging because in our virtual interactions, you know, we've seen this siloing problem sort of happening. Um, we, we sort of have two very distinct separate places where people go to talk. We have the issue queue, which is where developers go to talk to each other, and we have the forums, which is where users go to talk to each other. Um, and although there's no physical reason people can't post to both, developers sort of pull back because they can't take it when there's all these new people that don't know what they're talking about and haven't learned the community norms, and so they withdraw just as a matter of self-protection because they just can't deal with the noise. Um, and then what you find is, is newbies trying to support each other without the guidance of the people who brought Drupal to the place where it is now. It's very dangerous. Another thing that I think is very dangerous is about two years ago, we split the IRC channel. So it used to be that if you went to the Pound Drupal IRC channel, you would come to the contributor channel and it would just be people talking back and forth about all the patches they were doing and these initiatives that they're working on and this module and that module and the other module. And so new users would be sort of thrust into this buzzing beehive of activity around all these like smart, dedicated people to Drupal. And we got a lot of crossover of new users to contributors that way because IRC is really the only medium we have now that nobody uses the forums on the dev side um, to do that sort of informal chatter and sort of the way you make friends and stuff like that. We made the decision because we were sick and tired of telling people that it wasn't a support channel to just be like, ah, fine, make it a support channel and we'll go into Drupal Contribute and do our thing there. And that was a necessary step in scaling the people of our community because our developers can't, can't handle you know, the concentration level that they need to maintain if they've got someone asking support questions every three lines. But it's very dangerous from a scaling our culture point of view because there's a whole generation of Drupal users right now that don't remember a time when Pound Drupal was the place where stuff happened. 
And in fact, when Drupal 7 was released, when I was rolling the final thing and tagging it and putting it up, you know, Paul and Drupal Contribute was just a million miles a second of people like posting WebChick++ and Krell++ and all this, like just people super excited and it was just scrolling faster than my IRC client could even keep up with it. And then in Pound Drupal, it was like nothing. It was like, anyone there? I can't figure out nodes. Anyone? And it was just, it was like a very stark contrast to how the Drupal 6 release happened, which was with everybody in Pound Drupal throwing a huge party and stuff like that. So we've made that split. We've made that split where we have users and we have developers, just like every other project out there, and I'm worried about the sort of cultural impact that has because if the people who hold the cultural values in the community aren't there to mentor the new people coming in, you know, it's, it's sort of a dangerous road to go down because new people coming in start to feel like Drupal.org is a place where they take and consume and borrow from and not a place where they participate. Um, we can also take a look here at the evolution of the Drupal ecosystem in terms of maintaining that culture. So back in 2001, you had a bunch of basically hobbyist freelancers. They used Drupal because they had a website to build for their church or for some person that was paying them for it or whatever, but they were all independent people. There was no such thing as a Drupal company back in 2001. Nobody ever heard of such a thing. But when we hit our growth phase around 2005, there were Drupal companies. There was Civic Space, there was Bright, there was Civic Action, some of these bigger ones. Um, you know, and, and they all sort of started to gather things and, you know, freelancers sort of banded together and started to form coalitions and things like that. And there's still a pretty healthy freelancer hobbyist, you know, group. But people started to actually earn a living off of Drupal. We saw that in Dries' slides, how the number of people who earned their living from 2008 to 2011 even had skyrocketed so far. But this is when that sort of started to happen. Then in 2007, uh, a certain company that starts with an A and may or may not have several millions of dollars in VC funding uh, started up. And that sort of changed the ecosystem because all of a sudden there was like one company that was like on very different footing than the rest of the companies. The rest of the companies had sort of been like, you know, self-starters and things like that. And Acquia had VC funding. So they were naturally able to like, you know, put a lot of resources behind Drupal. And it was to the benefit of Drupal, but it definitely changed the dynamic dramatically from what had been happening before. And if you take a look at today, you start to see things like those, those big dots have gotten a lot bigger. You know, Drupal now is like, you know, it, it's a go-to word. Everyone, you know, for the most part in the IT world has heard of Drupal now. Like, we, we've made it, we've succeeded, you know, we've, we've passed that threshold. Um, but we can see that the number of freelancers and hobbyists is dwindling quite a bit as people sort of find ways to get paid to do what they would do in their spare time. And that's good. You know, it's a good thing to be able to do what you love and get paid for it. But it changes people's motivations a little bit and it changes their values a little bit as well. We also start to see things like Acquia acquiring different companies. We're not the only ones doing that, by the way. There's lots of people who are acquiring companies. But, you know, we have a bigger target on our backs because we're, we're big. But the, the funny thing about this picture, though, is that, like, you know, there are, there are shops like Capgemini, you know, some of these agencies that are way more Drupal Accenture. people. Yeah, Accenture. Than, than Acquia ever is. And, you know, like, so this is just a very, not a very complete picture. But this is what the community sort of perceives. And the community gets really worried about what happens when that big dot gets this big and all of the circles are inside of it, you know? But that's not what we want. I mean, Acquia doesn't want that. We don't want that as a community. That would be really bad if there was only one choice of who to go to for any sort of project. We want there to be lots of big circles and everybody working together and, and that sort of thing. You know, but in order to do that, you know, we all need to sort of band together and, and you know, contribute and make sure that, that that sort of happens. So before you change the slide. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, another thing that I wanted to point out here is that all of these big companies have all of these companies, as the community has grown, all of the developers and the companies are starting to come at it from, with different goals in mind for what they want to get out of Drupal. And that's caused a lot of conflict, too, because um, a lot of times these goals are in opposition to each other, and they need to like kind of work. We, it's very tough in the community to work that out right now. And so um, the, the community is facing a lot of problems with that right now. I think, for instance, you know, 
the stuff that goes for really high-end sites versus the stuff that goes for sites on shared hosting and stuff like this, you know. We're still, I think we're still trying to kind of find out where Drupal stands and what market it belongs in and stuff like that. And that's causing a lot of, the conf a lot of conflict right now as well, I think, as, as these companies grow and start to kind of focus on different aspects and things like that. Um, Jeff Eaton gave a talk about that earlier, if anybody saw that. So. Yeah. If you didn't, you can catch it online. That's Yay. right. Yay. Yay. Um, the other thing I just want to point out here is, is part of the reason Acquia is doing this acquisitions thing um, isn't to be evil and isn't to consume the lifeblood of Drupal because that doesn't make any sense from either a money-making or a professional or a community health or any other sort of perspective. What it is is that things like security and like migrations are really critical to us achieving our goal of like, you know, dominating this legacy platform business that Dries was talking about. Um, and if we absorb it into an organization that has the resources to turn out this into training curriculum and has the ability to pump resources into these tools to make them better for the community, we feel that that's a good thing for Drupal and we feel that's a good thing for, you know, for the entire ecosystem. So, Aqui is not the Death Star. Sorry, conspiracy theorist. <laughs> Dries is not Darth Vader. Yes, unfortunately. So uh, one of the th other things that happens with this, uh, with with all of these uh, big companies coming in, and I think it's been a problem uh, for a while, but nobody's really come out and said it. So I'm going to come out and say it, <laughs> is that uh, whenever you start bringing money into the picture, people start thinking that your motivations are changing. And so if I as a loan developer or hobbyist come in and put something into Drupal, uh, people can look at it and say, oh, he's a lone hobbyist and he just wants to see Drupal be improved. But if I, as a representative of a company that has a certain focus on, on Drupal, like enterprise systems or e-commerce or whatever, come in and push a change in, then it starts, people start seeing that through different colored glasses. They're trying to, they start seeing it for, well, is this something that's going to benefit him? Is that the whole reason that this developer is doing this change? Is just so they can get a leg up for their company? Is is, uh, is are they just trying to sort of enrich themselves on the backs of all of us, you know, open source uh, advocates and you know and you know Drupal lovers and stuff like that? Um, and I think a lot of that has been going on recently um, with regard to a lot of the companies that have been going on. Is that uh, is that you see sort of a lot of these pushes that are good for Drupal, but people people view them through the eyes of a, of differing motivations. And uh, I don't think that's really helpful for the project um, at all. But it's going to continue to be a problem as more of our top contributors become less hobbyists. I mean, of our top 30 contributors, was there anybody who wasn't working full time on Drupal at this point? Yeah, I'd have to look, but probably not too many. Um, and, and I mean, some of those are just working for consultants and, you know, they're getting their client sites up. But I mean, if you're in a niche market, like at, when I was at Palantir, they had a real niche around, uh, you know, doing museum websites, for instance. And, and if you're in a niche market and you're pushing, um, and you're pushing, for instance, Larry is really passionate about the fact that field API should work with remote data systems. Well, one of the reasons he's so passionate about that is because we've had to do so many clients who have digital asset managed, managed systems be their museum clients, and that's one of the reasons that we want to get that in. We do think it's good for the Drupal project, but a lot of people, you know, we're nerds and we think about stuff way too much, you know, and and our mind goes and we see ghosts everywhere, and so um, I, it's, it, I think it's a problem that we need to look at and face up to. Um, but another thing that happens with the money is that you know, we're based on the culture of a duocracy, and we've traditionally always been based on the culture of a duocracy. But when you're funded externally, it makes, it makes you much more able to do than other people. Like, for instance, right now, my company, Node One, is giving me half of my time at work to work on my initiative. And that, but, and that allows me a lot more of an ability to focus on Drupal than a lot of other people might not, than probably any of the other initiative owners at this point. Um, and so, um, and for companies like Acquia, who have determined that it's important to do something like improving the usability of Drupal, or for a company like uh, Commerce Guys, who are also um, venture capital funded to improve e-commerce and things like this, um, they are able to put much more resources into getting the things that they are important. And so it kind of, it kind of unbalances what we have traditionally thought of a one developer to one developer to one developer duocracy in a lot of different ways. Um, 
And it's something that we always, I think it's really important for us to keep in mind as our culture shifts and as we scale and grow, not just into being a developer focused thing, but into being a more professional marketing sales, broad based uh, organization and group of people. Um, yes, you can change your slides. Okay. And so a really important thing to come out of that, I think, is that, uh, you know, because I don't know anybody in the community who I've met who is looking to contribute to enriching themselves <laughs> specifically. I think a lot of these companies have, may have differing visions about what's best for Drupal in the long run, and that's healthy and should be discussed as we try and plan our future. But I don't think anybody has really this goal of taking over Drupal or using it to make them into Bill Gates or anything like this. And I think that one thing that we can all do is step back and sort of trust each other and assume good faith on all of our, um, on all of our work and all of our commits and all of the things that we're working on. Um, and I think that will go a long way towards reducing a lot of the tension that we see in the community today. Um, I mean, one of the things to keep in mind is that um, you don't dominate the world by making uh, church and community websites, right? And I think one of the things that we all want is for Drupal to spread really widely. But in order for Drupal to spread really, really widely, we are going to eventually, if it happens, get to that success phase that we saw earliest in the thing. We're gonna get to the point where Drupal is a stable, boring, slow, uh, not boring, it's a stable company. It will work more slowly. It will do different things. But um, I, I think that most of the people who are really passionate about Drupal are also really passionate about open source. You know, one of the things that I had a conversation with Jam about recently at our Drupal camp in Stockholm is like, you know, the whole concept of like, well, I just implemented an intranet for a Fortune 500 company. Am I still changing the world? You know? And I think you kind of are because, you know, one of the one of the things that we're spreading is not just Drupal. We're getting that crack for open source in the door at these places. You know, a lot of the places where we do these big enterprise installations are, you know, companies that have traditionally been Microsoft shops or Oracle shops or whatever. And you know, they may have a core of people who are really passionate about open source, who are really passionate about working a different way. And if we can just get that crack in the door and get those people really going about Drupal and about open source in general, then that can start to spread. And it's like every, every intranet that we do for one of these big companies or every little side community site like that is one more site that's, that's going towards the, the good side or whatever, you know? But I mean, empowering, and the, empowering users and democratizing the internet isn't just, isn't just for the small guys. It's like, it's like uh, you know, it's important for us to grow and to get into these things, and I do think it's just as important as doing, as, as you know, uh, changing the world in the more traditional sense that I think that we're all used to talking about. Well, and plus the beauty of open source is that when you fix a bug for Sony or Walmart or whoever, you're fixing that bug for Greenpeace and Amnesty International and everyone else who uses Drupal too. So there is an enriching thing that comes, and you sort of feel like Robin Hood, you know? It's like, ooh, I'm getting paid by some heartless evil corporation, but I get to help out like the people I donate my money to, so that's pretty cool. No, that's absolutely true, and it's a great point to, uh, to bring up. But, um, you know, again, as we see all these things happen, we need, to, we need to, you know, I'm not saying that any company that's big and has a ton of money shouldn't be kept in, shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't uh, uh, assure that they're behaving as good community stewards and stuff like that, but I think that in general we need to trust each other's motivations. Um, so the bottom line here is if, if you are feeling frustrated with Drupal right now and you feel like you don't like the direction it's going, you think that what the core developers are prioritizing is not what you'd like be, to be prioritized or you like what they're doing but you want it to happen faster or anything like that, the key thing here is you need to get involved because at the end of the day, you know, the people who actually do stuff are the ones who are going to make the change in Drupal. I mean, and if you step back and let like three small companies like run everything, then three small companies are going to run everything. Um, and I don't think that's good. I don't think that's good for Drupal to have very few voices. I think we need wide range of voices and a lot of people helping to drive the project, but it really requires, it requires documentation help, patching help, it requires testing help, uh, you know, user experience help, project management help, all of this kind of stuff uh, that we really need in order to make sure that all the voices in the project are being heard in the direction of, of Drupal. So please get involved and help us and, you know, like make your voice heard 
in the most direct way possible, which is actually like driving the direction of, of the project yourself. And with that, I think we'll open it up for questions or discussions. I'm not sure if this is what you guys were hoping to get out of this uh, sort of, you know, presentation, but we kind of felt like there was a lot of community sort of issues that were going around the internets, and it was good to have a forum for discussing those. So uh, I can't see very well, but yes, go ahead. Oh, okay. Here, I'll travel with the microphone to the questions. Um, <clears throat> I want to raise a, a point, a discussion we had on Drupal.org. Um, thing is, if you want, I think, if you, if you want to, to scale the community, for beginners, for newcomers, to get involved and to get in doing stuff and Drupal, the software, or Drupal.org, the website, or whatever, they need to understand Drupal. And uh, <clears throat> for this, I think one of the main things we need is as uh, all open source projects a good documentation and I'm not gonna please you maybe but for me like the the new books that just got out the definitive guide to Drupal 7 for me it should have been a book it should it should not have been um, it should have been in the Drupal.org documentation because for newcomers uh, to get involved they need to, under, I mean, basically they need to understand if it's, well, I don't know if you see my point, but uh, what can we do about helping others? Because for, uh, to help new newcomers, only old players can help the newcomers at this point. And uh, it's better to fix problems and to answer questions before they're asked. And for this, documentation is the, is, is a, is the core, is the core, I think. I think there are, I think that's something, I mean, obviously the documentation issue has been an issue for a long time. I know that Dries has set up um, uh, what he's calling gates so that we can't, so that one of the things that's going to happen for any commit to happen in Drupal.org is it's going to have to have documentation along with it. And Jennifer Hodgson, who's the, one of the documentation leads right now, has been extremely passionate about making sure that that happens properly. Um, but I also think there's, uh, and there's been a lot of talk around the documentation on Drupal.org now, and especially like, you know, our, our handbook pages and stuff like that, how we can make that more efficient and how we can keep them up to date more because they're really unmanageable right now. And I know that there's a core conversation at some point about uh, uh, addressing that um, sometime this week. If that's something that you're interested in getting involved in, they're always looking for help around that. I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. Uh, but I do think that the community is aware of, aware of it and uh, starting to uh, finally take a serious look at it. Yeah, and I guess one other thing I would say to that is, uh, you know, when I got started with Drupal, I, I applied for Google Summer of Code and I got accepted and I was like, oh crap, now I gotta learn Drupal, right? Mm -hmm. And back then there were no books. There was nothing, there was a couple of pages in the handbook that were written for developers and I was totally stuck and I had no idea how to do it. So the way I tackled that problem was I got involved in the community, I hung out in the support channels, and I tried to answer other people's questions, and most of the time failed. But once in a while I would answer one, I would feel so totally badass. But the first thing I would do when I answered that is I would write the documentation myself because I was at exactly the point where I knew what was confusing, and I had just figured out the, pro the answer to my problem. Because the, the issue happens when someone like one of the top 50 core contributors tries to write documentation for someone new to the project, it might as well be Klingon. They're not speaking the same language because they'll start using jargon that they're familiar with and other people aren't familiar with. One of the things that like, I don't think a lot of new people understand is that like, you can write, doc anybody can write documentation and the more new people we have doing that, the better our documentation is gonna be. I think you find our documentation lacking because a lot of times people don't start writing documentation until they're so far up the Drupal learning curve that they forget what it was like to be new and they start writing it for, you know, for themselves and not for, for other people. So don't be shy to wait in there because you could, you could write a page and it could be completely wrong, right? Let's say you just gave it your best shot. Entities are something, I don't know, something like this and this and this and this because you have to figure it out either way to get your site done. So just type up a documentation page and then, you know, go on IRC or post the documentation queue and say, hey, could somebody take a look at this and see if that's right? And probably someone will say, ah, oh, that's almost right, but not quite. And they'll edit it, and they'll fix whatever's wrong with it. And then you learn. 
And then they didn't have to write an entire documentation page by themselves. So that is a much more sustainable way to improve documentation than asking people to not get paid for a tremendous amount of work and instead do it for free on Drupal.org. You know what I mean? Like people have their own motivations, their own capabilities. We, it's not really fair to ask that of them. But I agree, ideally, our documentation is, is that good and you can just read it online. But that only happens if all of us help. <clears throat> I get your point completely. I already wrote some docu docs pages and uh, answered some support requests on the Drupal.org. Uh, but uh, what I'm saying is, let me find my words. Um, there is the handbook pages, like, and there are like end user documentations, how to create a view, how to configure this module, and everything. And then we have the API documentation, which will hopefully get even better than it is today, thanks to the Drupal, uh, Drupal 8 gates. And this is pretty cool, but what we lack is the in-between, I think. Like, okay, now I can use through the interface, like to do basic stuff, how to get in. This is, I think this is what lacks, because the, the API documentation is like pretty good, like per function, we have like the good comments, but how to uh, help people grok the whole Drupal thing, or at least just like the whole theming API, or the whole form API, or the whole, I don't know, feeds API for contrib module, or views, or anything. This is where we need to do stuff. It's interesting because when I was working on the initiative, I was looking at a lot of other open source CMS projects, and um, one of the ones that I looked at was Plone, and their documentation is essentially, they don't have API, which is terrible because API is a huge benefit for us, but on the other hand, what they have is essentially the equivalent of using Drupal and learning Drupal module development, and that's their documentation. And that's really great, but on the other hand, I have no idea how they organized a team to write that and keep it up to date between versions because that seems like a Herculean task. I mean, I, I could barely bring myself to write two chapters for the book that I worked on and I got paid to do it. And so it's like, um, it's like I, you know, the, the process of organizing that and finding a place for it on Drupal.org I think is really important, but I also think it's a very difficult thing to round up in the community. Yeah, and I guess what I would say to that is there's a documentation spread on Friday. Go. Say, this is an area that I feel is lacking. Uh, I know what I found confusing, and maybe you can partner up with someone and actually get, you know, a start on what you're looking for, because we need people like you to provide that perspective. So go to the documentation sprint participate. You know, it's all about participation. It's a duocracy, right? Effort, sorry, as Greg said, it's like yeah. a huge effort to organize the documentation like a book, like the definitive guide to Drupal 7 or to, yes, sorry, and the module development. So, this yep. is what needs. It, it is, but it doesn't get done if we just complain about it and don't help. So, we should help. We should all band together and make sure that that gets written. That's okay, but we need to, yeah. Uh, I want to address the question about trust and, and sort of this question of commercial or corporate versus um, social advocacy use of, of Drupal. So I come from the academic world and there's, and scientific research in particular, there's an extremely well developed and successful and long standing system there where anything that you have community resources for, meaning government money, that you, once you published it, it's now open source. People, for instance, cloning genes or making, you know, reagents or whatever you have to make that available to the community. That's just part of the system, and it works extremely well. So you have to publish it. That means that you document how to use it, and you write a method section in the papers and so forth, and it gets reviewed by people who understand how to read it, and this is, you know, this is no more technically demanding, or it's equally technically demanding to Drupal. Drupal needs something like this. And the people should be, companies should be expected to commit back whatever they've done in terms of Drupal development because they are making use of a community resource that doesn't have the sort of grant status and money exchange type of thing like federal grants do, but it's exactly the same thing. It's a public venture where a lot of people have put effort into it and so forth. It's just organized sort of differently. And I think that, that open, I've had this idea of academic open source for some time. I think that the open source communities, Drupal in particular, could learn a lot from how academia runs. And that would 
get at solving these questions because companies will be forced to provide back to the community in a very reasonable way. Do you want to respond to that? Or? Um, it's, well, it's difficult to force anyone to do anything. But I would say, like, the, the good companies and the smart companies in the Drupal sphere do give back their code because they understand the maintenance benefit of that. It doesn't, there's no reason for this to be volunteer. It should be required. It is, it, and it's required in the academic community and works extremely But who well. is going to require that? Because the code is GPL, and you can do whatever you want with it. It's, it's a matter of well, a company making the strategic decision that says. Yeah, but, I mean, you know, these licenses are evolving. So you've got Creative Commons where people are, you know, expected to acknowledge, you know, use of something. They have free use of it, but they at least have to say that, you know, got it from someone else, they can't just ignore that. If you, if you put a Creative Commons at the bottom of your, your page of content, that's the expectation. And if you don't do that, I mean, people can, in the scientific community, can uh, ignore these laws. And generally, you know, it's not like the government's on their door, but if they don't provide the clones, eventually people complain and stuff, it gets back to them. But yeah. it, there's no I, I think we exert similar social pressure. I mean, there's certainly a social pressure around any company making money off of Drupal to give back to the project. Because if you don't, you're just kind of being a jerk. Especially if you make money off of Drupal and then go turn around and say, boy, it sucks that the documentation's not better. You know what I mean? It's like, then do something about it. You know what I mean? Kind of thing. Um, but I think that I, the, the, the people in that bubble ecosphere, they get that. You know what I mean? Like the, the Chapter threes and the lullabots and the aquias and the node ones and those people, they, they understand that and they do give significant amounts of time back. The, the smaller shops that sort of heard you can make a lot of money with Drupal and then go in there and say, ooh, let's make money with Drupal, I think there's a cultural thing there that we can stand to, to sort of increase the, the knowledge of. Um, but there's some significant, like, just no-brainer benefit you give from giving back. I mean, you get karma in the community, uh, you raise the profile of your company, especially if, like, if you're the company that figured out mobile for Drupal. I mean, that's got you set for the next 10 years, probably, of, of client work, you know. Um, you know, my, my favorite example of this is actually, uh, sorry, I'll stop. Oh, okay. um, is uh, Sony funded the five-star module. So they funded the creation of the five-star module. Um, and then one of their direct competitors, Warner Brothers, turned around and used that same module on their site. Which, you know, from one perspective, you could look at it and say, well, that's terrible. They just paid for a bunch of development that their, their competitor got for free. But on the other hand, then Warner Brothers gave a couple of patches that fixed some bugs, added a new feature to it, uh, and I think they even ported it to Drupal 6 or stuff like that. I mean, so this is all stuff that people who are educated in the Drupal community value or open source community values even really understand. But I think that there, there's no way to mandate that from on high. It sort of has to be something that we individually sort of share that culture with other people. One of, one of the biggest ways to force that is that uh, I think it's almost impossible to hire a significant Drupal developer if your company doesn't give back anymore. I mean, I wouldn't go to work for a company that didn't. That's one of the biggest social pressures that we can apply as a community is just don't go to work for companies that don't do that. But uh, I agree with Angie that I think the GPL as it stands is an important part of who we are and what we do. And Drupal would not have grown without it. There's no doubt about it. And you can't just, I just don't think that's a realistic model. Alex. Uh, one, we talk a lot about um, getting people involved and getting them to start contributing and to get companies large and small to contribute. Um, but after a certain threshold, um, it's extremely expensive to contribute, right? So it uses a lot of time to uh, wrap your head around things, um, to actively participate in the issue queue, to hack on core, to really participate in an initiative actively is a full-time job. So that's really limited to people who have no life at all, or for people who, like Angie, unfortunately, um, or for people who um, are fortunate enough to work for a company um, that is able to sponsor a full or a half-time job, you know, job placement. So what that basically does, though, is it causes a situation in which the only people who are actively doing these, you know, um, working on core and doing and this stuff are, are more increasingly working for big companies. And there's a sort of a threshold for participation. If I happen to own a company that wants to stay small, it's almost impossible for us to, to do both things. So do you think we're creating a situation where the only people who are actively working on, on major initiatives are, are the big companies? 
that's that's definitely a huge risk, right? Um, so, you know, the, the idea that, yeah, it's fine for Acquia to give, you know, two engineers full time for a couple of weeks for Drupal 7 because they have whatever, 800 engineers, no, they don't, but you know, they've got like 12 engineers and so they can take a couple off of the pile if they feel that that's important. But it's a lot harder for a four person business to do something like that and make that kind of big initiative. And it is hard with this duocracy model, it, it creates inequality, right? It creates a huge inequality because even though we all want the same thing, we all want Drupal to achieve world domination and our goals and our values are very similar. Um, one person who has more resources than another person is automatically at, a, at a more of an advantage to get their stuff done because this person's basically reduced to just like yelling really loudly when things aren't going right. You know, it's like, stop, please don't do that. That's terrible. But they can't actually invest the time to actually code the alternate solution that would get us out of that rut. We ran into that a couple of times in Drupal 7 actually, like the field API um, and some of the UX stuff and things like that. Um, I mean, I know, I know sustainable con, you know, con, contrib has been one of your sort of fire fighting issues. It's like, yeah, it's one of your passionate things because I know a lot of small shops, they want to give back just as much as, a, as an Acquia or, or one of the larger people, but it, it's significantly challenging. And I don't think we as a community have ever really figured that out because you know, you, you have this body, the Drupal Association, who could potentially set up a grant system to, to go and fund core, but then that gets really dangerous into now the Drupal Association is driving the direction of core, which you also don't want. So it's, it's one of those things that I think we really need to talk more about because it's a, you know, we, none of us, including Acquia, want to get into the situation where Acquia is coding core by itself. You know, that's a terrible situation. We want, you know, people representing small businesses in, in, in Minnesota, you know, to have an input in the direction of core and to be able to direct that. Um, so yeah, I, we need a better model. I just don't know that we've kind of figured out what that is yet, but I completely, absolutely see the danger there and, and we need to figure something out. Do you have any comments on that? No, I think you covered it. Um, <laughs> Tom, there's a well, mic. Oh, okay, I guess we're in. We'll come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sorry, I stole your question. Um, so the money discussion comes up a lot. And I actually need some education in the other direction because I have yet to really understand it that don't we want to take this application out in the world and apply it to problem after problem and solution after solution until 10% of the web is using it to solve business problems, to solve real life problems that to me, the people in the community, not who are also who are building it and contributing, which of course I 100% agree, agree is essential or it doesn't exist, but also there's all these people that are out there taking Drupal and building the custom theme and writing the modules and applying it to solve all kinds of complicated problems with this tool and charge for the services involved in doing that. And I, I don't understand why that's perceived as a negative thing. I would think it's the point. <laughs> I talk a lot. I don't see it as a negative thing. I think you're right. <laughs> I mean, um, I, think, I think the problem comes with, you know, it, it, change and growth and scaling are hard for any company, and it's hard for us too. And, you know, I think, I think a lot of the people who came into Drupal came from this sort of kind of hippie nonprofit area. Um, and I think, I, I, just, I just think that there's been a real tough adjustment and this change has happened so fast. I mean, in 2004, the global Drupal revenue was nothing. It's like seven years that we've gone to this. It's unbelievable. And I think that it's just been a really tough for people to adjust to this, especially people who were there at the beginning and, and to figure out how to like wrap their minds around this re new world. I mean, a lot of those people are used to startups because a lot of people just jump from startup to startup and they're really used to small, tiny companies where everybody knows each other, you know? And now suddenly they're in this community and they feel really passionate about it, but it's like changed, like almost out from under their feet. And I, I don't think necessarily that anyone thinks that we shouldn't have a sustainable community and the people shouldn't get paid or any of those things. I just think people, I just think the changes happen so swiftly and so like massively that uh, people are still trying to figure out sort of where we are and where we're going and what this means to them kind of thing, you know? I mean, would you agree? Yeah. Yes. I've talked a lot already, so I'll leave it at that. 
Uh, thanks. I just want to make a comment back on that last question. Um, sorry. Uh, I grew up in a small town. My name's Tom. I'm a colleague of Angie's at Acquia. I grew up in a small town in a small business across the river from Angie in Wisconsin. Plug for that state. Um, anyway, we, we've got a new initiative at Acquia that we think we can involve some small companies. We, we really believe very strongly that small companies are, um, you know, the heart and soul of the ecosystem around Drupal. It's where the creativity has come from. It's where Drupal's been built from. And this effort effectively, we, we call it a large-scale Drupal. It is focused on some of the difficult problems that are really hard to uh, address in Drupal. And we're working with organizations that are willing to fund that. And effectively, what it'll end up with is grant-like situations for smaller organizations where will act kind of as a project manager and a go-between to try and find people to contribute on these various efforts. We're actually hiring a, a program manager to work in the office of the CTO together with Angie and Dries and Mo Schweitzman. And uh, I think it's an exciting step. It's a step. It's not the answer, but it's an a step to try and keep, you know, that innovation and the growth in the, in the small companies. Cool. Thanks. Um, about the Equia City office, don't you think that um, if too many top contributors are, are hired by Equia, it's going to be an issue in the discussion because if everyone is coming from the same company, it's going to be bad for Drupal because the people that are active for the project are going to come from the same company. Uh, what is Equia is trying to do is really good because they are getting things done. But if too many people are going to the same company, uh, the, the balance between the people is not going to be the same. You will have some Acquia guys maybe deciding some stuff internally and then discussing. The, the key point is that everything is happening on Drupal.org right now, but isn't going to change a little bit if too many key contributors are going to Acquia City office. I apologize because I didn't totally understand, but so you were saying, um, isn't there danger in Acquia continuing to consume all of the top talent in the Drupal project? And, and doesn't that basically harm Drupal in a roundabout way by, by taking out like the power from under its feet kind of thing? But is that the gist of what you asked? Um, yeah, I mean, it's something that every time we hire someone at Acquia, there's always an email chain that goes around expressing that exact same concern. You know, it's like, is this, is this the hire that pushes it beyond, you know, the point where Drupal is sustainable? But, you know, I'd say two things to that. One is that it takes two people to change companies, right? Um, nobody extracted me from Lullabot, like, kicking and screaming and uh, strangling me and dragging me behind a truck. I mean, I made that decision. And I weighed that decision very heavily, but I made that decision, and I'm happy with that decision. You know, Mosh and Greg sold their companies. They made that decision. Um, I think that there's two sides to that. One is that when we, and Tom is sitting right there, and he's my boss, so I better watch what I say here. No, I'm but um, but when, we, when, we, when we hire somebody, though, the, the end goal there is, is, is sort of two parts. We think about, okay, we obviously think about how is that going to help Acquia make more money because, hey, we want to make money. We're a business, right? But we also think about how is that going to help the Drupal community be sustainable. It's actually not good for the Drupal project that there's only one person in the community that knows anything about migration. That's bad, that's terrible. That's a horrible situation to be in. We would love there to be 50 curves, and then we could all choose from it, and, and hopefully this you know, vacuum will cause other people to come up. But in the meantime, what Acquia is trying to do there is pump more resources into the migration module because we can put some engineering talent behind that that we have that Moshe's company doesn't have. We can do things like create training curriculum around migration and start training Drupal shops and Drupal professionals on how to do migration stuff with tools. And suddenly, we start scaling the amount of people who can do migration work, which is critical to capitalizing on that opportunity that Dries talked about. So I would say, like, from the top down, that concern about the impact on the community has, or I'm sorry, the impact on the community that a new hire or a new acquisition has is always at the very forefront of the thinking there. Um, but, but I would also say that I think it's wrong to deny someone from furthering their employment because there's a concern about the community thing, you know. Uh, my, my wife is the most patient person on this earth, and she put up with me spending all of my nights and weekends for the last three years on Drupal 7, but at a certain point, that's got to stop. 
And if there's an if opportunity to, you know, get paid full time to work on doing the same stuff I was doing anyway, I'm going to take it, you know. I'm going to take it and, and it's, I think it's a good thing for the project because we need someone who can think about this stuff full time with the kind of resources that Acquia has behind it. So, um, but it's, it's absolutely something that we think about every single time because we're very sensitive about that picture of the ecosystem and we want to make sure that it stays diverse and it's not just the Death Star absorbing everything in its path because that's not good for anyone. I would, I would also add one point. I think that, um, well, I think Angie's completely right um, about, um, about this being a two-sided coin and that people want to go to work for places where they can fulfill their dreams and stuff. But to some extent, that's up to all of us, too. Because like when I was looking for a new job from Palantir, one of the most important things for me was I, I thought I'm, I'm a very high, highly in demand skill set right now, right? And I should not, I should A, not let this go to waste because it may never happen again in my life. And B, I don't want to just jump to another development shop or another consulting shop. I'd like to find something really cool and unique to do, right? So while it took me a year, I did. I found a company that would bring me to Europe to live full time and was willing to dedicate to me the resources to work on the stuff for Drupal that I thought was important. There is no reason why any Drupal developer in the world should not insist on the same thing. All of us are in such high demand right now. I feel like I want to be like Norma Ray. Uh, standing on the table with that huge sign, right? There's no reason for anybody in the Drupal universe to not be doing exactly what they want to right now. And, and one way to do that is to not do stuff for companies that aren't letting you contribute, for companies that do things unsustainably, to insist because you're the, you're the resource driving this, not them, that that you you know get what you want and deserve being a high being a high uh, demand job set right now. And then that sort of gets to Michael's point about you know we exert social pressure, which effectively raises the bar for making sure that people contribute back. So the short answer is that it's good, but we don't need only Acquia doing that. We need other companies hiring more people, dedicating some time to Drupal Core. Oh, we'll take. It's really echoey in here, so it's hard to. Yeah. Not just. So, sorry, if I can just completely change track for a second. Um, I've been lucky enough over the past year to be brought into a company who were working on ASP.NET and changed them completely over to Drupal, which has been a great opportunity. But I find that it's almost the project managers and the bosses and the client managers and those kind of people who don't understand Drupal enough to understand why it's so important to allow the developers to you know, commit back to the system or, or to give back into the community or whatever the case may be. Is there anything out there within the community that can help me turn them around and <laughs> convince them? On, on lullabot.com, there's an article about, I forget what it's called, but it's basically about that. It's about the benefits that you get from contributing back. Um, Jeffy's raising his hand, so he might. Oh, I can't see that at all, but. Oh, okay, never mind. Okay. Um, yeah, so there, I wrote something a, a few years back about that. We could really use, though, like an actual like white paper or something about like this is open source for people who don't understand it, and this is why you give back the actual financial benefits, the actual karmatic benefits, or whatever. We don't really have that resource that I'm aware of, um, but it's definitely something we could we could really use. Um, maybe you could come to the documentation sprint as well, or do we have that too, Tom? Yeah. Okay. You're right. Opensource.com has resources like that. That's true. It's not Drupal specific, but it would be it would help them understand the, the ecosystem a little bit and why contributing to open source is, is good. I actually think we're out of time. Oh. Can we just answer with Jeff Eaton talk? Oh. So we, we have two more questions. Uh, well okay. We we can cut we have fifteen minutes of coffee break. There is a five o'clock session and it's four fifty, so and if we, we can do it have quickly. To be at that session, don't we? No, at five we ours is five thirty. Ah. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Okay, one more question. 
Basically, uh, the company I work for scaled up really rapidly uh, along with the rest of the Drupal community, and one of the things we're facing now is a concern that there is such a thing as too big, uh, too big to preserve the kind of individual agency and trust and quality that we really want, um, and also keep the kind of uh, atmosphere and community that we want to be in. Are you finding that same thing? Are you having those same conversations in the Drupal community as well? Um, yeah, so the, I, I didn't catch all of that, but basically uh, you, the concern is that there is such a thing as too big of a community, right? And have, has the Drupal community have discussions about that? And yes, um, there's this constant tension between developers and new users that sort of drives people into silos. Um, there's also like, at the same time, paradoxically, a drive to get more diverse people involved, like Dries talked about marketing people and product managers and people like that that are currently not in the community and we want to have more of them in. Um, in terms of dealing with the scaling there, what we tend to do is, is siphon people off to groups.drupal.org, which are special interest groups. Um, so there's like a group for education and there's a group for uh, social networking and there's a group for this, that, and the other thing, um, where people of like mind tend to congregate uh, in their own sort of sub-community almost, but part of the larger sphere. Um, so we have certain commons areas, like the issue queue, where we all congregate, everybody, the big messy pile of all of the Drupal people. And then we also have like sort of focused quiet rooms almost, where people who are working on a specific initiative or a specific you know, area can sort of congregate as well. So that's kind of how we've handled that. And it seems to work to some extent, um, but I imagine we will get to that point where, you know, and maybe some would argue we're there already, where there are just too many voices in solving each individual issue that it just takes too long. Um, and then, you know, that the way to answer that might be to delegate even more responsibility further down the chain or something like that. But, but the good news is we have a lot of tools for, for dealing with that stuff. And when we don't have tools, it's Drupal, so we can just make them, you know. So, yeah. I'm so You make it sound so easy. <laughs> Good night, everybody. No, I'm just kidding. Did you want to say one more thing? Or is no, I think I'm... Okay, I'm sorry, guys. We need to wrap up because we're five minutes over. But uh, anyway, thanks for coming.